Hello. Thank you uh, everyone for joining our, our webinar. This webinar is on uh, best practices for handling trade secret, restrictive covenant, and uh, choice of law issues. This is the last uh, in the series of Khan Maciel Carey's uh, employment webinars for this year. And uh, next month we will uh, uh, publish our list of webinars, probably about a dozen, uh, for next year. Uh, this uh, Con Maciel Carey is a boutique labor and employment law firm. Uh, my name is Andrew Summer. I'm presenting with uh, Dan Deacon. Dan Deacon is an associate from our DC office, and I am a partner in the uh, California office. And the, the topic for today uh, will cover a number of considerations near and dear to many employers uh, on protecting trade secrets, uh, handling uh, delicate situations involving departures of employees, uh, employees joining uh, the company, and uh, uh, the, the concern about uh, employees uh, potentially bringing on trade secrets for, uh, from a, a competitor or uh, departing with the company's trade secrets. Um, we'll discuss a number of considerations. It's important to keep in mind that in enforcing uh, tra your trade secrets, your co confidentiality of your proprietary information, that you keep in mind uh, the jurisdiction where you're operating. And uh, there are a number of key differences by state and by uh, local municipality. And uh, those are things that's important to, to keep in mind. However, we are giving an overview of uh, many of the issues that are common uh, in the various different states and uh, pointing out areas in which uh, certain states deviate significantly. Uh, again, my name is Andrew Summer. I'm a partner uh, at the California office of the firm. Uh, my practice is uh, primarily litigating uh, uh, employment-related claims, including trade secrets claims, and counseling employers on a variety of employment-related issues. Uh, I also uh, work with our OSHA practice on uh, representing employers in Cal OSHA enforcement proceedings. Uh, and now I will turn it over to Dan Deacon. Thanks, Andrew. My name is Dan Deacon, and I am an associate here at Con Maciel Carey in the Washington, D.C. office. Uh, I, I practice in both the Labor and Employment Practice Group and the OSHA Workplace Safety Group. Um, and in that capacity, I rep represent employers during inspections and investigations conducted by federal and state OSHA, um, advise and counsel employers uh, through OSHA citations. Um, and on the employment law side, I represent and advise employers in all aspects of the employer-employee relationship, uh, including wage and hour disputes, claims of discrimination, um, non-compete agreements, um, and I also review and revise employee handbooks for employers and draft workplace policies and procedures. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Andrew. He's going to go over the agenda, and we'll get into the meat of the webinar. All right. So uh, for this webinar, uh, we're covering uh, four different primary subject matters. The first is uh, trade secrets, uh, both discussing uh, what is a trade secret and how to protect those trade secrets, uh, and then uh, we will address as well uh, non-compete agreements uh, which are available in certain states but not all states uh, and different considerations in the hiring and termination process. We'll also discuss choice of law provisions. The choice of law provision is essentially uh, a, a term that's inserted into an agreement that provides for the, the state law that will apply in the resolution of any potential dispute. We'll also discuss uh, foreign selection clauses, which involves uh, the selection of a jurisdiction of a court where any uh, subsequent dispute uh, would be litigated. Again, the, the focus will be on a national framework for how these uh, issues are, are, are dealt with uh, throughout the country, but we'll also look at certain significant changes, uh, differences by state. Now, beginning with uh, trade secret considerations. Uh, the, first of all, what is a trade secret? Uh, most employers uh, will take a very personal view of this and look at all of their information as being a trade secret, as being confidential in some form and being important to the company. Uh, of course, not everything that a company has is, in fact, a trade secret. Uh, and the framework for looking uh, at this issue to evaluate whether 
uh, the information at hand is a trade secret is looking at whether the information is confidential. Uh, the information generally should be uh, secret. Um, it doesn't have to be absolutely secret, um, but you're looking at uh, whether this information generally is uh, known to others or the general public. Uh, and uh, most trade secrets are information that are available to individuals on a need-to-know basis within the company, but not generally disseminated. Uh, also, another consideration is whether the information uh, that is involved in this trade secret has economic value. Is this something that would provide some sort of unfair advantage to a competitor uh, if this information were improperly shared with your competitor? Uh, and then you, you also need to look at whether there are reasonable efforts to maintain the secrecy of the trade secrets. And this is a really key consideration. You, you need to have certain uh, steps in place to ensure that the information is maintained uh, uh, private and not uh, disseminated uh, improperly to others. And this is an area that's probably most frequently litigated uh, when there is a dispute involving a trade secret. I find the that most that mostly when an employer loses that trade secret protection, that's because they're not engaging in the proper steps to ensure that that information is secured and confidential. Uh, lastly, on this point, uh, the, there is a Uniform Trade Secret Act uh, that has been promulgated uh, by a commission to create a uniform standard throughout the nation about 47 states have adopted this Uniform Trade Secrets Act, and this, uh, as a result, there is more uniformity among uh, various different states in terms of defining what a trade secret is and what the mechanism is uh, for seeking enforcement. And now typically, you have a remedy for a trade secret violation when there is a misuse of that information. And it can be simply that an employee takes that information that they are entitled to use in the scope of employment and misuse it either, either during the employment relationship or after leaving. Now, continuing further on this inquiry, uh, trade secrets, uh, it's a highly fact-specific inquiry. Uh, there's no set standard where I can tell you that in all circumstances, for example, a customer list is, is a trade secret. It depends on a number of variables. And you're looking at uh, you know, primarily the nature of the confidential information and the role that it has within the company. If this information is something that is really key uh, to the lifeblood of the company, uh, and you look at uh, it being uh, something that, if misused, would you know, cause damage to the company, that's an important consideration in finding that this is a trade secret. You're also looking at, you know, as I mentioned in the last slide, how the information is safeguarded to make sh making sure that there are reasonable measures to ensure the, uh, the privacy that, that, this, this, that this information is safeguarded. Uh, so in terms of the, the first point, uh, is the information known outside of the uh, owner's business? Uh, if, if this is information that's generally known to the general public and to competitors, it may not be a trade secret. Uh, if it's information uh, such as pricing, um, key contacts for, for certain customers, that is information that generally would not be known to competitors, and it would be information that would be relied upon by a court in concluding that this is in fact a trade secret. You also look at measures taken by the owner to safeguard the secrecy of the information that's consistent with what we were just discussing. Uh, are there uh, confidentiality agreements? Are you, uh, is, this, is this covered in a handbook? Uh, is there training of employees to address this issue so that they understand what, a tra what information is confidential and potentially a trade secret and it cannot be shared outside of the limited number of people that are in, in, entitled to know this information in the course of running the business. You also look at the value of the information to the owner and to the competitor. Is this something that you know, has minimal economic value, or is it something that uh, if it was shared, you could find your, the whole uh, 
business significantly impacted. And so that's certainly a consideration uh, by the courts in evaluating this. You also look at the amount of effort and money expended by the owner in developing the information. If you have software code, if you have business plans, marketing plans, that you have labored over and developing, and it's the, the kind of the linchpin of the, of, of the business um, uh, viability, then that certainly would, would be an important consideration by a court in determining that something is, in fact, a trade secret. And lastly, you're looking at uh, the ease or difficulty with which the information could be uh, uh, pro properly acquired or duplicated by others. So you know, if this is something that could be uh, easily developed by a competitor um, to compete with you and developed on their own, uh, you know, it, that would be a consideration in finding that perhaps it isn't a trade secret. If it's something such as a, a, a software code that's developed um, by that um, business, it's not something that would likely be developed by a competitor, then that's an important consideration. Again, you're looking at all of the factors together. In, in different states, there's different variables that may weigh more heavily, and that would really depend on the uh, the decisions in, in, your, in your state and how this has been interpreted. Um, now moving to some examples of trade secrets. Uh, uh, you know, obviously not everything you have would meet the definition of a trade secret. Uh, for the purpose of running your business, you want to construe confidentiality as broadly as you can. Uh, but then recognize that you know, practically if there is a dispute and you ended up in court, there may uh, be uh, information that you consider confidential that would not ultimately rise to the level of a trade secret. Uh, so you're looking at a uh, customer list, for example. That's one of the more uh, heavily litigated issues in this area. And uh, not all customer lists are trade secrets. Uh, it, it would you know, depend on a number of, number of variables. Uh, you, you look at you know, primarily is the um, customer's identity common knowledge? You know, for example, if you're looking at a contractor that has a number of different customers, uh, their uh, customers might not be public knowledge. You wouldn't know who out there in your, your community has a need for the specific trade that you're offering. But there might be other areas where um, the customers uh, are known. You may have an industry where there's a very small universe of customers that you would be uh, seeking business from. Uh, and you may have a tougher argument there arguing that, that those customer lists are uh, trade secrets. Uh, but then within the list, there's other details. There might be pricing information that's more likely to be found a trade secret. You may have key contacts within a customer that would not be known to the general public. And again, you might be looking at whether you know, on that customer's website, do they list all of their contacts that you could reach out to on certain matters, or would that be you know, guarded and not um, obvious? You also look outside of customer lists at, uh, you can consider formulas, manufacturing processes, uh, computer code, um, marketing and financial plans that you'd be developing that would be uh, not g generic to your uh, industry but specific to your business. Uh, pricing information, that's one of the real key issues I find in this litigation where you're looking at pricing arrangements with certain customers. If that information were known to a competitor, they could you know, undercut you and, uh, and, and take away uh, some of your business. Uh, there's also different studies. It can be research or otherwise. You're looking at strategic business plans, testing data, uh, training manuals, and that could involve training man manuals on the products or services you offer that could be harmful to your business if shared with a, com a competitor. And just generally within this framework, you're looking at the value of this information and how it could be uh, misused by a competitor if it was in a improperly shared with a competitor. Uh, now, how to protect your trade secrets. This is probably one of the more important areas for an employer. Is It's not enough just to uh, characterize something as a trade secret. Uh, and you, you have to have steps in place to inform your employees that you consider this information to be confidential and that they're limited in how they can share this information. 
And so what I always recommend is that you want to have a confidentiality agreement at the start of the employment that clearly delineates the responsibilities of the employee in language they can understand and describes the, the confidential information in detail that's uh, applicable to your business. I think one of the, the number one mistakes is to take a boilerplate description of the trade secrets that you might have uh, from you know, some agreement maybe from a different business that you just apply to your business. Uh, that could be found improper to show or inadequate to show that you're safeguarding that information. You should tailor the language an, as much as you can to what you're actually using at your business. And you want to consider a confidentiality provision in this agreement uh, that uh, restricts the use of this information, can only be used in the course of the employment relationship, and can't be misused and given to anyone else while they're employed. You also want to consider restrictions on uh, an employee after, uh, at, during or after the end of the employment relationship soliciting customers or coworkers. Uh, this is an area that you'll need to uh, uh, be careful with in terms of considering various state laws. For example, in California, there's some pretty significant restrictions on a, uh, a a restrictive covenant that concerns uh, the solicitation of uh, customers or employees. Uh, and then what's really key in all of these agreements is to, to ensure that there's language requiring the employee return any confidential proprietary information at the end of the relationship. And it's important not only to have this in the employment agreement, consider just repeating it in, in the handbook. Um, I think re reiterating this as much as you can is helpful. Also, in, the, uh, in terms of processes, you want to make sure that you have measures in place that uh, protect this information. Do you have password uh, protections on your computer, both for login and for access to certain databases? Do you have anti-deletion programs? You want to be able to ensure that your system is set up electronically in a way that if an employee uh, misuses information, uh, emails uh, confidential information to a personal email or to a competitor or somewhere else, that you have a way of then conducting forensics a after the fact to confirm exactly what was done uh, and to uh, be able to build your case for a, a trade secrets um, prosecution. Uh, you also want to uh, characterize information as confidential, uh, whether that be uh, on a document uh, itself or in the system electronically um, to have some sort of designation uh, in your uh, database that this information is confidential. And uh, further, in terms of other internal steps to protect the trade secrets, uh, one important point is to limit access to the trade secrets. Uh, not everyone in your business, for example, needs to have access to your uh, detailed customer list with pricing information. If there are individuals that are outside of that area that do not need to use that information, consider not providing access to them. Uh, and um, limit also document circulation. Uh, if you have memos on certain customer information that's sensitive, can you share that with only high-level management? Does that need to go to the rest of the, the workforce? Uh, the more the information disseminated, the more likely it is that there could be some sort of impropriety and uh, misuse of the information. Um, take periodic inventory of trade secrets. Uh, how are you uh, preserving this information uh, in paper form or electronically? It, are there potential issues in, in how the information is being, being used? And to consider that um, periodically in, in updating your practices. Uh, it's important to disseminate company policies on protecting trade secrets. Uh, dispose of documents completely uh, that are confidential after they've been used. Uh, if you, know, you have a meeting, for example, where you are reviewing in paper form certain trade secrets issues, um, consider not distributing that in paper form uh, and destroying any copies after the fact. It's also important to consider training. Uh, if you have a, a training of uh, employees on, on various subjects, 
subject matters consider also including something on confidentiality and the importance in, uh, in the employee understanding how to uh, properly use this information consistent with company policy. Uh, and then, you know, regarding the uh, confidenti confidentiality non-disclosure agreements, uh, that you'll want to draft carefully uh, considering where you're doing business. If you're a multi-state employer, uh, you may want to consider uh, having different agreements uh, uh, drafted somewhat differently depending on the state where the employee is located. Uh, California, for example, has a number of different restrictions that, you know, in, based on my experience, I've recommended that employers uh, have a California-specific agreement uh, unless the California version is something that they're comfortable with using nationwide, which is usually, uh, or in many cases, uh, sufficient. Uh, so you, in terms of just the general framework, recognizing that states vary in their approach to this issue, you want to look at whether the uh, agreement is reasonable and uh, some of the factors that are considered in determining uh, whether the NDA is reasonable. Is you look at the interests of the disclosing party in keeping the information secret. Uh, are these uh, truly trade secrets? Is this information that, information that could be harmful to the company if shared with a competitor? Look, you look also at the period of time that the information must be kept secret. Generally, the courts find that uh, information uh, can be, uh, or there can be a requirement that the information be kept secret during the employment relationship. Where it gets dicey is when you look at the period after the end of the employment relationship. How long can you insist on, this, on maintaining the secrecy of this information? You also look at um, uh, burdens of compliance, um, uh, you know, for example, on the employee, is this an, imposing an undue burden on the employee? You look at the interests, uh, you know, the public interest in maintaining this information private, and most critically, the information um, that the employer is seeking to protect must actually be, must actually be confidential. You can't just have a blanket um, protection on, on all information. Um, and now I'm going to turn it over to Dan uh, to discuss non-compete agreements. Great. Thank you, Andrew. This is Dan Deacon speaking, and I'm just going to go over uh, a number of slides here covering non-compete agreements um, and some tips about how to handle uh, employees, uh, your current employees that have a non-compete agreement or employees that you are hiring um, coming to you with a non-compete agreement uh, from their prior employer. So let's begin first with what is a non-compete agreement. In its simplest form, it's typically an agreement or a clause in a larger employment agreement where one party, typically it's going to be the employee, agrees not to enter into or start a similar profession or trade in competition against its employer, his or her employer. Um, and normally we hear about non-compete agreements in the employment context between employers and employees. And the actual effect of that agreement typically doesn't arise um, as an issue until the employer-employee relationship has really ended. Um, the validity of a non-compete agreement uh, it varies by state, and you're going to hear that a lot. Um, the, the inquiry that courts use to determine whether a non-compete agreement is valid, um, how they remedy uh, uh, unenforceable non-compete agreements, uh, it, it all varies by state. Um, but generally, the standard that most courts uh, across the country use, um, you see here on the following slide, the three elements. First, it needs to be supported by consideration at the time it is signed. Uh, two, it must uh, serve to protect the legitimate business interests of the employer. And three, it needs to be reasonable in scope, geography, and time. So we're going to go over uh, these three elements briefly over the next couple slides. Um, but first, in terms of consideration, uh, where a non-compete agreement is executed as, as part of an original employment agreement um, at the time an employee is hired, that offer of employment is generally considered adequate consideration for the covenant, the restrictive covenant. Um, but explicitly identifying a specific portion of an employee's compensation or other types of benefits as consideration for the restrictive covenant uh, 
um, can also remove any questions about the adequacy of consideration. Um, so that's something to keep in, in mind as well. And the question of whether there's adequate consideration becomes a little more complicated when a company enters into a non-compete agreement with an exi existing employee um, rather than a new employee. So in, in some states, continued employment um, of an at-will employee alone likely is going to constitute sufficient consideration um, when that existing employee enters into a new agreement. Um, containing that restrictive covenant. Um, in other states, however, continued employment, uh, regardless of, of the length of that employment, probably it won't be adequate consider consideration for a non-compete with that existing employee. So given those, those variations in the state laws and the changes in the courts regarding adequate compensation, uh, a company seeking to minimize consideration issues um, can provide existing employees additional uh, additional compensation or material consideration um, directly related to that non-compete. And that can often come in the form of, as I mentioned, compensation, um, such as a raise or a bonus, uh, eligibility for annual performance uh, or other types of bonuses. Um, but it also doesn't need to be monetary. Additional non-monetary consideration can, can also suffice, such as uh, promotions to a new title, uh, access to confidential or trade secret information, additional training, um, continued or new access to, to new customers. Um, so, so those are also a couple things to, to keep in mind. But the following two elements that we're going to go over are really the meat um, uh, of the inquiry. So as I mentioned, the validity of a non-compete agreement is going to vary, uh, vary by state. And in fact, some states don't generally permit non-compete agreements at all. And as you can see on the screen here, here's a, a few examples, uh, California being one of them. Um, and although uh, a lot of other states, a majority, the overwhelming majority, uh, permit non-compete agreements, most courts disfavor them. And the rationale for why courts disfavor these type of agreements is um, Basically, it's, it's a restraint on trade, and it interferes with competition, um, and it impairs the availability of services and workers to follow their personal interests. So as a result, courts scrutinize non-compete agreements closely, and it's critical that employers and businesses draft these non-compete clauses and agreements that are reasonable and, and narrowly tailored. Now, by narrowly tailored, I don't mean um, limited. Right? Employers want the non-compete agreement to be broadly written, but you need to be realistic and careful about the drafting so as not to make it unenforceable. Because as, you, as we're going to discuss later in a couple uh, slides, um, depending on how you draft the language could very well mean um, your non-compete is unenforceable and basically meaningless. So the language and the terms are really important here, and that's what I mean by narrowly tailored. Um, Additionally, when drafting, it's important to really research uh, the legal aspects of it and how courts in your state analyze and treat non-compete agreements. So broadly speaking, a court can typically do one of three things. Um, the court can throw out the entire agreement uh, not to compete, and that's often referred to as the red pencil doctrine. Two, the court can attempt to rescue a portion of the the provision by striking out the violative clause that renders it unenforceable, and that's known as the blue pencil doctrine. And three, a court can attempt to equitably reform the contract provision where basically the court will rewrite the contract to be consistent with the party's original intent um, as modified by the extent of, of the law in that jurisdiction. So you might be asking yourself, what's, what's the difference between all these well, it's really important, so let's take an example. Say you have a covenant um, not to compete that says uh, the employee agrees not to work for any business uh, that competes with the employer located within a 20-mile radius of the employer's headquarters for a term of five years after termination of their employment, his or her employment. So under the traditional analysis here, it's probably going to be a problem because that five-year period um, 
is going to be considered too long. The, the question that we're dealing with now, though, is how are the courts going to handle this? So the easiest case, of course, is that red pencil doctrine. The court is basically just going to say the covenant not to compete is unenforceable, uh, no questions asked. That's the bright line approach. It's, it's seldom used, and there's only um, one or two, I think, three jurisdictions that use that, one of them uh, being Virginia. On the other end of the spectrum, we have two and three, where the courts follow that either they're going to strike that one violative uh, provision. So in this case, under the, the, the second um, provision I was telling you about, the blue pencil doctrine, they basically strike out the five-year uh, time period. Under the third uh, provision there, the equitable reformation, basically the court can look at that and say, hey, five years is too long. But, um, you know, based on our precedent and our, uh, our existing law here, six months is reasonable. So the, the non-compete is enforceable, but only for six months. So moving on to the legitimate business uh, interest. Um, regardless of how well a non-compete agreement is written, no court is going to enforce it unless the employer identifies a legitimate business interest. Um, that is acknowledged as something um, that is protectable. So case law has expanded upon the meaning of legitimate business interest, but again, this varies by jurisdiction, and ultimately the courts are going to apply a totality of the circumstance review uh, to determine whether there is a legitimate uh, business interest, and that's going to be a fact-specific inquiry. So while the courts have really been you know, reluctant to clearly define the term um, they have been clear regarding what is not a legitimate business interest, and this is uh, something important that you should keep in mind. Um, a legitimate business interest does not include uh, simply protecting the employer from general competition. Um, in other words, employers, uh, they don't have a, an interest in preventing employees from competing through the use of general knowledge and skill um, or, or those skills acquired from the employee through training or experience. So what are protected legitimate business interests? Uh, on the slide here, we can just see a couple examples of what courts um, in various jurisdictions have found to be protected. Um, we have trade secrets, as Andrew discussed in the first portion of the presentation, intellectual property, customer lists, goodwill with customers, uh, profit margins and costs, uh, employer, employer practices and methods, um, and then training and education. So finally, we're on to that third element uh, where we're going to look to see whether the non-compete is reasonable in scope, geography, and time. Um, and the court is basically answering the, the overarching question of whether the provisions of the non-compete agreement are overbroad. And again, this inquiry is going to be based on the totality of the circumstances. It's fact specific, um, and it's going to vary by jurisdiction. But ultimately, non-compete agreements uh, can be limited with respect to time, uh, scope, and geography. Um, so let's first you know, go over what courts look at and what you need to keep in mind when drafting your non-compete agreement. First, time. Uh, this is one common mistake that employers can make um, that can be resolved with, with legal help from the beginning. A common reason that courts refuse to enforce uh, these non-compete agreements is uh, that they're for an unreasonably long uh, period of time. So if you have uh, a non-compete agreement, if you've drafted an agreement that's prohibiting an employee from, from competing uh, with, with competitive employers, uh, for the rest of his or her life, that's, that's going to be unreasonable. Um, the general rule is the duration of the agreement shouldn't exceed the time reasonably necessary to protect the employer's legitimate business interests. And that's what the courts are going to be looking at. What, consider, what is considered reasonable is going to vary uh, by business to business, um, and, and it's going to require specific consideration of, of the facts and circumstances surrounding the agreement. Uh, the importance of the, the employee services, um, and there's several several inquiries that go into that. But presumptively, 
typically one to two years is going to be reasonable, and a, a common number that uh, we, we typically see in non-compete agreements is six months, um, and that, that's typically going to be a reasonable period of time. Um, next, let's look at geography. Uh, an agreement can be enforceable if it restricts competition in uh, an overbroad territory. If, if there's an unreasonably large territory that you're prohibiting an employee from working, um, that, that's probably going to be unenforceable. So non-competes usually describe uh, that restricted area where they can't compete, um, and oftentimes it's, it's determined by miles, uh, a certain radius around the facility or the region that, that the employer works out of. Um, and while these, these restrictions in, in geographic scope can, can vary from agreement to agreement, um, it, it really comes down to it being reasonable. And like the determination of reasonable uh, duration, what, considered, what is considered reasonable geographic uh, restrictions varies from business to business, again, depending on the employee types of services they're providing and so on. Um, again, legal advice uh, to, to make sure this is tailored to your business and industry and your particular circumstances would be extremely valuable in, in determining that appropriate uh, uh, restricted territory that you're, you're contemplating. Um, third, we're, we're going to go on to the, the scope aspect of this. Um, and when we talk about scope, this relates back uh, uh, to the employer's legitimate business interest. And it also overlaps with, with those first two uh, categories that I discussed, time and geography. Um, so here, the, a court's definitely going to be asking, what is the scope of the contract, and is it overbroad? And typically, various provisions are going to discuss um, several uh, provisions in a non-compete are going to discuss the duration of that covenant, the requirement to keep uh, information confidential, uh, and restricting employees from soliciting or hiring, uh, hiring their employees. Um, and, it, and there could be a description of, of many different things. Uh, the, the clients that the employee can't solicit, that might be perfectly spelled out, um, and, and so on. But covenants prohibiting an employee from essentially working uh, in the same or similar industry, if it's, if it's basically prohibiting them from working at all, um, that's, that's, of course, going to be considered overbroad um, and unenforceable. I see we have a question here. Are non-competes ever enforceable if an employee is terminated but not for good cause? So that's a good question, and that is very uh, jurisdi jurisdiction specific. Um, if an employee is um, considered not to be terminated uh, for good cause in some jurisdictions, um, a court will consider that uh, non-compete agreement to be unenforceable now. Um, but again, that's a, a jurisdiction-specific issue, and that doesn't ap apply across the board. Um, so if you have any uh, additional inquiries about, about uh, state-specific um, termination for cause uh, questions, please just reach out to us. Going on to some exemptions. Uh, now, many professions are statutorily exempt from non-compete laws, and this is also going to vary by jurisdiction. You can look this up uh, through case law uh, so, uh, and, and statutory law. So some common exempt industries or professions include physicians, as you see on the screen here, physicians, nurses, psychologists, social workers, uh, veterinarians, uh, lawyers. And there's also a couple of jurisdictions with unique exemptions. For example, D.C., uh, Washington, D.C., exempts broadcasters. And the justification for those exemptions uh, our public health, public policy, and ensuring the free flow of information and ideas motivate the prohibition or limitation on non-compete agreements for those occupations I just listed. I see we have another question here um, that states, can we omit the geography part if the company has a national presence or the employees are remote? Um, there's several ways that you can draft these non-compete agreements. Um, you don't necessarily need to uh, limit it by geography. 
um, it, it can. Uh, there's a number of different uh, ways to go about um, doing that, but you can um, perhaps list the the types of, of employers um, and and the types of uh, services that may be um, uh, limited um, to that employee, um, and whether that's going to be enforceable again. It depends on the state. But here we're going to look at, onto the next slide, hiring employees with restrictive covenants. Um, so I just want to you know, go over some, some practical tips for employers uh, when, when you're going through that hiring stage uh, and you, you have a prospective employee that comes to you with a restrictive covenant. And the, the key here is you want to take reasonable steps to protect your business from interfering with uh, with that competitor's uh, restrictive covenants. You don't want to be stepping on any toes and getting yourself into legal trouble. So at the interview stage, when considering a new hire, the first one here is simple. Uh, during the interview, why don't you just ask whether that individual is subject to an employment agreement? And if they answer yes, get a copy of that employment agreement pre-hire. Um, you, you should also inform the applicant during the interview stage um, that the company insists on full compliance with employment agreements and is committed to enforcing those. Again, this is all for the employer's protect, protection. And finally, remind the employee uh, that the company does not want the applicant to disclose or use any of the competitor's uh, confidential or proprietary data. Next, if you do decide to hire that applicant with a non-compete agreement, um, there's, there's one, one other step here during that hiring process. In the offer letter that you are sending to this prospective employee, confirm that the company expects the employee to comply with their former employer's agreements, and specifically reference that in the letter um, and make sure it's maintained in their personnel file, in their records. Uh, keep, you, keep a copy of that letter, and if they provide you the employment agreement, Hold on to that. So now, again, you've just hired the employee with a, a non-compete agreement. Uh, so what now? They're working for you. Well, here's a few tips to make sure you don't run into any conflicts with the employee's prior agreement going forward in, in your normal course of business. Um, first, review that restrictive covenant with the employee immediately and ensure that they understand how to comply with it and clear up any ambiguities that they may have. Um, basically, you just want to set the standards straight and, and clear everything uh, up for them from the beginning. Two, have the employee create a comprehensive uh, customer list if they have one uh, that the employee serviced well at their former employer um, and about whom that they have confidential information. And you're going to want to maintain this list and make sure it's updated regularly as will help you uh, fend off any, any problems later. Uh, three, you can consider creating what's, what's known as a Chinese wall between the business that the employee serviced at the former employer. So basically, this is just creating an ethical wall around the employee to prevent disclosures uh, and prevent them from having access to their, their former uh, relationships, and thereby limiting any problems uh, uh, with a non-compete agreement. And finally, you want to avoid allegations of flipping. Uh, that's basically, you know, you don't want to be known as the employer that's taking business uh, or, or taking contracts from, from prior employers just by hiring their employees. So now let's go on to termination. What are some of the steps that you should take when one of your employees is leaving uh, for a competitor? And the key here is you're going to want to take reasonable steps to secure confidential information, right? So first, why don't we, we start here with the comprehensive exit interview. Uh, during that exit interview, you're going to want to, again, review the employment agreement uh, and the non-compete agreement that the employee signed at the beginning of their uh, employment with you, uh, and remind them of those obligations to maintain confidentiality, uh, the duty not to disclose, duties uh, not to solicit. Um, essentially, you're just going to go over the, the employment agreement at each and every term and remind the employee that it is now in effect. Two, uh, 
these are just good practices all around as well. Uh, you want to collect all company-issued property. That includes cell phones, computers, documents, key cards, um, and, and you should be doing this uh, no matter what, as it's good employment practice to, to prevent any, any of your proprietary data and your uh, physical property from, from going missing. Um, three, immediately remove employee access to computer networks, emails, uh, and servers. This is one sure way to limit their access to any information that you do have backed up um, and, and that you want to keep protected. Uh, similar to that, uh, secure and do not reissue hard drives from laptops, desktops, uh, or anything of that nature. And conduct inventory of hard and electronic copies of your files. Make sure that nothing is missing. And finally, you can contact their new employer and notif notify them of the employee's obligations under her, uh, his or her employment agreement. Um, that will, you know, put the employer, if they aren't on notice already, that their uh, uh, new employee is subject to a, uh, a non-compete agreement. And that should trigger all those steps that we previously just um, discussed about when you're hiring a, an employee with a non-compete agreement and ensure that they're following those steps as well. Um, finally, one of the last slides uh, I have here before I turn it back over to Andrew is you're going to want to take certain steps to secure your marketplace position uh, and re retain those client re relationships. You, you don't want business to be disrupted um, by an employee leaving. Typically, this, this may be uh, an employee that had a lot of relationships um, and was a, a very successful employee at, at your company. So f first thing you want to do, you're, you're going to want to fight for your customers um, and, and businesses. And, and in doing that, uh, you want to identify the new employee or, or the, those executives publicly. Um, that can be done through emails to clients, uh, newsletter allowance, announcements, client alerts. Um, you, can, you can obviously get creative there, but you get the picture. Two, you want to assess your customer and business relationships here. And, and you want to, to identify those most vulnerable and make an in-person contact with them as soon as possible. Uh, introduce those contacts, those business relationships um, uh, to that new person and, and make sure they know who they're dealing with and, and remind them that they're in good hands. Um, it's, it's important to do this for all your clients, but those, those most vulnerable and most important to you, um, you should definitely make sure that you lock down that relationship sooner uh, rather than later. Uh, three, you want to send correspondence to your customers generally announcing your new rep. Uh, that kind of goes along uh, with, with number one there. After you hire this employee, um, make sure that you, you have an announcement. And let the, let the uh, customers and, and your business partners know uh, that you've carefully selected an individual well-qualified uh, to continue servicing their business. Um, and four, uh, you're going to want to remind customers why they do business with you, um, not why they should do business with an ex-employee. And you don't want to defame that former employee. Uh, not only is that a potential legal issue, uh, of course, it's just a, a bad look for an employer. And it may serve as more of a turnoff uh, to clients um, and business par partners and provide more uh, of a sense of unease. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Andrew, and he's going to go through a couple more steps. Okay, I wanted to just follow up with uh, on one issue that was uh, discussed by Dan regarding the uh, exit process for a departing employee. Uh, one really important uh, point is to uh, make sure that you save the hard drive. Uh, for your departing employee. Uh, so if you later on find out that there's been some misdeeds in connection with the uh, uh, separation and the uh, employee joining a competitor, you can uh, conduct forensic uh, of that uh, hard drive and determine what the employee was doing right before he or she departed. And there's a number of different uh, uh, forensic firms that can be retained uh, to conduct this uh, investigation if necessary. 
Uh, in terms of communications with employees after uh, a coworker departs, uh, you want to be careful uh, on a number of different fronts uh, to avoid any potential uh, legal claim for defamation or otherwise. And, um, uh, and one point would be to uh, discuss with employees, you know, prohibit any discussion of the circumstances of the employee's departure. And by that, you know, we we mean that you are not um, that there's not this gossip around uh, the circumstances for the departure um, and information that might get out there um, uh, to defame the employee uh, in the eyes of the competitor that they, this individual has now gone to work for. Um, and you also, you know, just want to uh, ensure that there's no no false accusations about the employee. Uh, that are then communicated. I, mean, I think the most important point is is the communication with customers and business partners. So if you look at customers, you don't want your your workforce um, um, sharing information that might be false or misleading with customers about that departing employee. And the best practice, in my opinion, would be to keep it simple. That employee has left, is no longer working on your account. We have another employee in-house who's fantastic, who's taking over this account, and keep it at that. Uh, in terms of internal gossip, there's a limit to what you can regulate, but you just obviously want to have a, uh, a uniform uh, message that there shouldn't be uh, this communication of, uh, uh, unnecessarily about circumstances for the departure. And then you also want to discuss with your workforce uh, that you know, they should come forward and let you know if there's any unusual activity that they're discovering by the departing employee. Uh, and that could be activity uh, as that person's uh, uh, preparing the departure you know, uh, before the employee leaves and as well as afterwards. There may be communications with the customer where they're indicating that they've been contacted by that former employee and that they said all sorts of things that were false or defamatory. Uh, the other uh, point that you know, I would raise is to uh, discuss with your employees their obligations uh, regarding their fiduciary duty to the employer. Even liberal jurisdictions like California recognize a fiduciary duty by the employee uh, during the employment relationship. And by that, uh, I mean uh, that the employee needs to uh, ensure that the, uh, that the interests of the, the company are considered uh, in, the, in the course and scope of, of that employment. Uh, so you're looking at um, their uh, the general knowledge, skills, and experience acquired during the employment, uh, and that they uh, not use, uh, uh, not engage in any competition with the uh, with the employer during the employment relationship, uh, and you also uh, would address any confidential information or trade secrets that are acquired during the employment relationship that that cannot be misused. Uh, during the employment relationship, um, whether it be uh, to share it with a competitor or to share it with a party that doesn't have a need to know this information. And then regarding uh, confident, confidential information, um, it's, it's important that an employee understand, and again, this is really reiterating much of what we've discussed already, that during the employment relationship, through agreements, handbooks, discussions, that it's understood that the employee uh, cannot uh, 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 misappropriate uh, the company's trade secrets uh, to compete with the company uh, during the, the employment relationship. And in some situations, depending on where you are operating, uh, that that may apply as well after the end of the employment relationship. Um, and, but, but one point I did want to make is that most jurisdictions do recognize that trade secrets cannot be used to uh, compete with the company. Uh, where, uh, where there's uh, more of a gray area is when you get into the subject of non-compete agreements that go beyond the trade secrets themselves. Uh, you also want to discuss with employees that they shouldn't be uh, solicit soliciting customers while working for the employer, and that's part of their fiduciary duty to the business. Uh, they shouldn't solicit other employees uh, to leave the company uh, while they're still working uh, for the employer. Um, they shouldn't uh, carry away any confidential information, such as customer lists. And 
when there is a situation where you suspect uh, that there is a misuse of the confidential information, typically by an employee that is uh, departing and going to work for a competitor, that's where it's really important to have an action plan. And these sorts of matters should be considered long before you have any sort of incident. Have an action plan of how you're going to address a situation like this where it arises. Uh, you have all of your policies in place to protect your confidential information. You have the exit interview process. And then uh, when you have a suspected uh, wrongdoing, uh, then you can ramp it up to the next stage, which may be taking for example, here as we've indicated, uh, securing the backup tapes and potentially reviewing those backup tapes uh, through some forensic protocol uh, to determine whether uh, there has been any wrongdoing uh, that may be actionable. And, and in these situations, you may have sophisticated IT on, uh, on, on site that can do this, or you may need to use an outside forensic uh, investigator. Uh, and then also you want to um, treat the allegations regarding this wrongdoing as confidential. Uh, you don't want to share this with too many people. And one of the reasons would be that this information could get back to the uh, departing employee and could cause them to modify their approach and undermine your investigation. And you want to avoid invasion of privacy, um, and, and that being uh, when you are reviewing uh, this information, you want to, are you looking at, are you focused on the company's server and the laptop that you gave to the employee as well as the smartphone that you gave an employee? Um, are, are you looking at the employee's personal uh, email account if you have access to that? You, that's an area where you could have a potential invasion of privacy claim. Um, are you also uh, sharing information uh, unnecessarily? Um, to others within the company that may be private in nature. Now, uh, regarding uh, this investigation in terms of the categories of information or sources of information that you'd want to look into, uh, there's uh, the office personal computer. Obviously, you'd want to look at what is uh, on the computer uh, that the uh, the, that the employee access. This could be information stored on the server. It could be on a laptop. You want to, want to conduct this investigation of this data to determine what was going on and whether you might have a cl claim against this former employee. You're looking at email. You uh, uh, can look at voicemail. And one consideration, too, in terms of your personnel policies is to make sure that your uh, personnel policies reinforce that there's no right of privacy uh, to the company systems, that you have a right to, as the employer, to access their email, their voicemail, other public sources uh, to, uh, to re retrieve information as necessary, for whatever reason that may be. Uh, and then you also, if there's a smartphone that's provided to the employee, uh, that may be a source of data as you're reviewing it when it comes back to you following the departure of the uh, employee. Uh, there may be phone records that you can look into. There's uh, maybe a telephone dial-out, dial-in records that show the calls that were being placed. Uh, there's also access cards to the building. Uh, that's a really important source of information. Uh, many companies don't keep that data, um, but it is tremendously helpful. Um, for example, if you need to show when an employee was coming to work, when an incident uh, may have occurred, and there's you know, benefits in that data outside of even trade secret situation. And there are also um, video surveillance cameras. Uh, if there is, uh, are, are cameras showing um, that there's physical records that were actually being taken by the employee uh, before the departure. And that's a question also of the protocols you have in place well before an incident occurs. How often do you, do you keep that surveillance data? Many employers keep it for a relatively short time frame and then they tape over uh, the data or they simply just don't retain it. Uh, you may want to consider having that data for a longer time frame uh, since typically you will not know that there's a need for this until some days after the, after the fact. All right, and so the next subject is a choice of law provisions for uh, Dan to discuss. Yep, thanks. Uh, sorry, it looks like we're going a little bit over time here, so we'll try and get these next few slides over for you uh, quickly and efficiently. 
Um, so I'm just going to talk about choice of law and conflicts of law clauses that go into your employment agreement. So what is a choice of law clause? This is another clause that you should be putting, uh, or you should at least be considering putting in your employment agreement. It's a provision whereby parties agree uh, that the law of a particular jurisdiction is going to gover, govern any disputes um, arising under that employment agreement. So parties routinely agree that laws of, of a particular jurisdiction are going to govern their relationship. And that objective is simply to ensure that uh, uh, a particular body of law is going to be applied <clears throat> in the event that a, a dispute should arise. Because as you all are probably well aware, uh, there's different laws in different states and how contracts are interpreted. So this is where the research uh, and the preparation comes in in preparing that employment agreement. You're going to want to know uh, what um, jurisdiction uh, is, is arguably more beneficial for you in terms of uh, enforcing those agreements. So they're generally enforceable. Sorry, here's the, the first slide. They are generally uh, enforceable. And although they are, um, choosing there, there's a couple of problems that, that typically arise. Um, choosing a, a law and a forum provides absolutely no comfort to an employer if the court hearing a dispute refuses to honor those choices. So just as with uh, the substantive law that's going to be applied, um, courts are going to take different views as to whether the choice of law specified in, the, in an employment agreement will be respected. Um, and there's several different tests that have been adopted throughout uh, the country varies by state by state, um, but there, the most prevalent one is the is, is this restatement uh, second of, of conflict laws, and that's the most significant contacts approach. Um, it, it basically the, it's a two prong inquiry. Um, so long as there's a substantial relationship to the parties of the transaction and the law selected, and the law chosen is not contrary to public policy of that state. Uh, it, it will typically be upheld. Now, I mentioned there's uh, tests in other states, um, and other states treat this differently. For example, in California, specifically, uh, Section 925 of the Labor Code prohibits the use of contract provisions that apply in other states' law or require um, adjudic adjudication of those disputes in another state as a condition of employment uh, of, of an employee that resides and works in California. Um, so, difficult questions typically arise uh, when assessing whether the chosen state's uh, laws actually conflict with a fundamental policy uh, of the forum state where the suit was brought, um, and whether that forum state has a, a greater interest in the matter. So here is where approaches vary considerably uh, by state. Courts uh, like Virginia are generally going to going to enforce a non-compete agreement even if it's uh, unenforceable under its own law. In contrast, some other courts um, in, in other states are not going to honor uh, a choice of law if the non-compete agreement uh, would be unenforceable under its own law. So that's why it's important to also include a forum selection clause, which Andrew's going to discuss here in a second, specifying the forum where disputes should be resolved. So here's just a couple of the, the common pitfalls. One, uh, we kind of went over this, choice of law does not equal forum selection. If you select uh, a, a choice of law but not a forum, and the forum in which you are sued doesn't honor your choice of law, then you have a serious problem. Uh, two, selecting a state that does not bear uh, a reasonable relationship to the agreement may render the provision unenforceable if it's just ridiculous. Um, if you, for example, if you are a Delaware, uh, your, your business is incorporated in Delaware and you operate in Maryland uh, and Virginia, choosing New York law and New York courts is likely going to be um, an issue and it's going to be challenged in court. Um, so a narrowly drafted provision can result in the application only to the construction and interpretation of the contract and not to extra contractual claims. So here's where you want to use broad language. So for, for example, New York, uh, they provide for an independent remedy in tort for parties with a breach of contract. 
So you're going to want to make sure the choice of law provisions apply to any and all claims arising out of that employment agreement, including contractual disputes, torts, uh, such as negligent mis uh, misrepresentation, fraud, and so on. And we'll turn it over to Andrew to uh, the final slides, and we'll wrap it up. Yes, and to follow up on what uh, Dan was mentioning is that with a choice of law provision, it's you know you can't just draft a contract and just throw in you know we're in California we're in New York but I'd rather have the law of Texas, uh, and that there's a number of considerations in terms of there has to be some sort of nexus and also uh, you're looking at whether there might maybe a, a a public policy in the home state that's against, uh, that would be infringed essentially in using the law of another jurisdiction. Uh, so it's, uh, there's a number of variables there, but just moving to form selection clause, and we'll be brief here, um, but it's, a form selection clause is essentially a provision where the parties agree that any litigation resulting uh, or arising under the contract will be uh, initiated in a specific forum. So uh, you can be employed in, uh, in New York, and there's a provision in the contract saying that any dispute would be litigated in uh, Florida. And uh, the issue there typically is, you know, in terms of enforcement, is if there's some sort of nexus to that forum. Uh, in the federal court system, typically the courts have found that there's an adequate uh, connection to that other forum if the uh, employer's headquarters is located there. Uh, so, I mean, if you have a business, that business is headquartered in Florida but has an employee working in New York, they could, under many circumstances, maybe not uniformly, could uh, select Florida as the forum for any resulting litigation. But if they just picked Oklahoma and no one resides there, there's no business there, there's no headquarters, uh, that would be uh, a bit of a stretch there. Now. Uh, in terms of drafting uh, the form selection clause, um, uh, y y the language needs to be clear. I mean, you want to make it clear that the exclusive forum is selection is that jurisdiction so that the uh, employee doesn't have an option about where they pick uh, the location uh, to sue. Uh, also, uh, you cannot uh, write into a, a contract uh, federal jurisdiction. Uh, that's something uh, that has to exist uh, under federal law uh, in order to get into federal court. Uh, and um, the, there's, you know, there's various different options we don't really need to get into now, but in terms of, the, of being able to transfer a case to a different jurisdiction, even if you, you uh, don't dispute the form itself initially and you end up uh, submitting to jurisdiction in that in the state. There's this concept of four non-convenience, where you can essentially ask the case go where that in, to the location that would be most convenient, where you have the witnesses, the documents, etc. And oh, and one other point I would raise is, uh, you know, there are certain state laws you need to keep in mind about form selection clauses. California enacted a law, for example, that prohibits employers. Uh, from entering into a contract with an employee um, after January 1 uh, of, of, of 2017. And it's, whether it's a contract that you enter into or that you modify, it, that contract cannot um, require the employee to litigate or arbitrate a dispute outside of California for, for claims arising in California. So at least for your California employees, if there is an agreement with them, you need to uh, recognize uh, California as uh, law and the uh, forum as applying uh, to any uh, resulting dispute. Uh, now we will uh, share a copy of the uh, PowerPoint and the recording with you all, uh, and um, and I think we've answered um, several questions, a couple questions already. Um, you can certainly um, reach out to us individually if there's any further issues. Thank you so much for attending.